Presented by the Hockey Shop, source for sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. Let's get into it. It's In Goal Radio, the podcast. Darren Millar, along with the co-founders of In Goal. It's David Hutchison and it's Kevin Woodley. I don't know which one's which. I, I have trouble telling you guys apart. I, I look at the screen all the time and I thought, uh, were, were you guys really brothers back in the day? And you just took different names to try and create your own identity? Woodley, is that what happened? Clearly, I need to put my seat up taller or something. Like, come on. <laughs> you know, Hutch, as we record, I wish, I, I again, I wish we put this out in video at times. One day. One, One day. day. Thank you. Because Hutch does this thing where he puts his camera way up high and and tries to look. This, so it kind of hides. It gives you this different interpretation of his height. There the word you're looking for is illusion. Yes. Yes. The illusion. That, that, but you just said you had to get taller so you could match me. I know that's what I'm saying. If Darren thinks we look the same, then clearly there's something wrong with my camera angle. How tall are you, Woody? I'm short. Six, eight? <laughs> no, I am not as tall as our feature guest today, Nikita Tolapila, who is six foot six. Mm-hmm. I used to think I was six foot one, had most of a disc removed in my back, and I'm now told that I'm under just a hair under six foot. We're five foot 11 and wow. three quarters. I'm sure you and, can. And Hutch, what are you? Back against the wall, put the ruler up. What are you? Four foot? I'm an optimistic five foot eight. Five foot eight. I'm five eight. I'm five eight like Woody was six feet tall. Um, Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll buy that because I'm not buying that you're five foot eight. When was the last time you saw me in person, Darren? We're at that age where we're shrinking. Long enough ago that that you would have shrunk half a foot. You 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 really do have us confused then. This is the most I've ever be touched. The most of all time. Hey, uh, on the subject going, of that. Keep going, brother. Keep going. Uh, uh, Aiden Hill. What I'm going, they're on the road right now. He will not be back uh, until the 25th of November, in and around there. But what I'm going to do is talk to Aiden and find out how tall he is. Because on one website, he's six foot four. Uh, on another uh, listing, he's six foot six. And why that matters, again, is if he's six foot six, he's the tallest goalie to ever win the Stanley Cup. And I have yet to get confirmation on. How tall Aiden Hill truly is. Isn't it funny that we don't actually have confirmation? <laughs> like, no. I mean, there's there's a goalie. I'm not going to name. What is that? Tell I'm you? not going to name names. There's a goalie that I cover semi regularly around. He's listed at six foot four. He's a highly ranked prospect. And there is no freaking way he's even six foot two. He is the same height as me, maybe an inch taller. And they list him at six foot four. And I've had other goalies mention this, like, hey, how the hell did that happen? So, like, seriously, especially considering this matters, that people look at goalies differently based on perceived heights. And I think my favorite story ever is filing a, uh, an NHL.com story one year on Jonathan Bernier. And it was a story on sort of the challenges of sm- smaller goalies and do they pay attention to each other's success. And I'd I talked to Bernier about sort of watching Soros and 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 I just instinctively wrote Bernier five foot like five foot eleven Jonathan Bernier, and my editor sent me a note saying, "Hey, like you got all the, the stories about under six foot goalies." Well, Jonathan Bernier is six feet tall, and I'm like, "What the hell are you talking about?" I've been covering Jonathan Bernier for more than a decade, and he's been five eleven when he was drafted. He is five eleven with these three or four teams. Like he's always been five eleven. All of a sudden, he got to I think it was Detroit, and he got listed at six foot. So either like it's just the whole thing is hilarious, like especially because this matters like it it shouldn't. But it does the perception of a goalie and how tall he is like that. We have no accountability for the accuracy of these measurements, especially for prospects is freaking absurd. Well, it's great timing because Dustin Wolf in goal for the Calgary Flames and so much emphasis on his height which ties into the Hall of Fame class this year. I had a chance to speak with Mike Vernon last week, and he, he's on record, told me flat out, there's no way he gets looked at in the draft uh, today because of his height. And I said, uh, well, you're 5'9". He's like, no, no, uh, I'm, I'm 5'7", in and around there. Doug Sauter, when I played junior, put me down at 5'9", and it never changed. I am not five nine. Love it, and and he was honest about that back, and that was back Calgary Wrangler days. Well, first of all, Bernier, the, the original interview, Calgary Wranglers. In that interview, I remember Bernier saying he doesn't think. Now remember, he's an eleventh overall pick 
back in the day. And he doesn't think he even gets drafted in the modern NHL, or at least he told me that years ago that, you know, as the, as that evolved, um, I think Mike Vernon's right. Second of all, hook us up. We need Mike Vernon on the Ingo radio mm, podcast yeah. as well as your podcast. So let's make that. Happen. No, it wasn't, it wasn't mine. I, I was tagging along, helping somebody out uh, okay. on the Bob McCallum podcast. Cause Bob's uh, recovering from uh, his uh, stroke and uh, doing the rehab. So I'm, I'm helping out John. Shepard. Okay. You're forgiven. You're back in the union. You're so I was on. I was purely riding coattails on that. Uh, absolutely. How cool was it to see Henrik Lundqvist back between the pipes today? Yeah. And you know what I thought was he might overplay a couple of those shots because they were so slow in that game. Like, is, is that how everybody's men's league looks? Because I, I see great players out there, Hall of Fame players out there, and they're not. Uh huh. There's no wind resistance there because they're not going fast enough. Hey, not all of us are used to the standards set by NHL players, there. <laughs> so, uh, some of our games look like that on the regular. But I thought it was pretty cool. Like Craig Anderson out there as well. Yeah. Uh, recently retired. So a couple of guys who I think, if you needed them and in a pinch, could probably still stop a few pucks in the National Hockey League. I just thought it was. Pre- I just listen. Hank didn't start. Yeah, because he had. Half. That's only because I think that's probably because he had to be out there for the ceremonial face-off before, didn't he? Didn't oh, he get okay. his jacket, or was that was that oh. on Saturday night? I thought he. I thought no, there was a ceremony. He was kind of late getting in to get changed there. Okay, I'll, so. I'll, I'll buy it. I, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. Truth be told, live stream it. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. On, on I this. didn't. I'm not going to pretend to watch the whole thing either. I just thought it was just even seeing him back in gear again. I mean, just. You know, I'm biased, right? Like for my generation, like it was him, Price, and Luongo, right? Those were the best. And uh, obviously, we have a soft spot spot in our hearts for Hank. Uh, time he spent with us when he would come through town in Vancouver, sharing things on his gear, on his game, the way he evolved over the years, um, the hour he spent with us on the podcast after retiring, like just uh, one of the all-time greats, not just as a goalie but as a person. Henrik Lundqvist, Mike Vernon, and Tom Brasso, the Hall of Fame class among goaltenders for 2023. Uh, We have heavy hearts uh, in the goaltending community uh, because of the passing of uh, a couple uh, close to us. Uh, Roman Czechmanek played uh, four years in the National Hockey League, primarily with the Philadelphia Flyers, and Sean Murray, uh, a goalie coach in your neck of the woods, you guys. Yeah, in in Vancouver here, Sean Murray, I think probably most... Well, probably won a Memorial Cup with the Vancouver Giants, known for that. Uh, worked with the Prince George Cougars, worked with the Nanaimo Clippers, but I think mostly known for his work at the Burnaby Winter Club, as well as with performance goaltending schools. Um, our thoughts go out to his family, obviously his friends, uh, his co-workers at performance, partners, Rob Fuchs, Joey Ali, um, Jordan Sigalette, now with the Calgary Flames, was a part of them when they all got started and still did some work with them. I was told this today, I didn't realize this, but we think now of these goalie schools that work with minor hockey associations sort of hand in glove, where um, the idea that you bring in one of these private schools and you have sessions once a week and you make sure that the kids get goaltending instruction in minor hockey through those relationships and those partnerships, that started with Sean Murray way back in the 90s, evidently. This was an idea that he had, and now it's common all over North America and the North American hockey world. And that was something that he pioneered and, and many followed suit with. So um, literally thousands and thousands. I do not think it is an exaggeration at all um, to say that in terms of the lives he touched as a coach on the ice. We've seen some very kind words passed along by some of those that he impacted. Um, you know, I think of people like Andrew Hammond, uh, obviously the Hamburglar, famous for his run in Ottawa, who came through here in this area and worked with Sean um, I know Cordy Porter was really close to him, uh, sent a, a nice message about almost being like a second father, saw a nice note on Instagram from Ian Clark, whose son Blake had worked with Sean since he moved back to work with the Vancouver Canucks. And just just the tip of the iceberg, guys. Like, again, when we say thousands and thousands, that isn't an exaggeration. Like the, the goalie schools in the summer, the associations he worked with, just a guy who was so passionate about the position and so upbeat and enthusiastic when he taught it. So much energy that he, that he brought to the ice and to the people he worked with. Hutch? I don't know that I can add much more than Woody's added there. I mean, uh, I mean, Woody knew Sean a little bit better than I did, although I d- definitely had the pleasure of meeting him and, and uh, talking goaltending with him in the past. 
didn't mention, I don't think, though, Woody, that he'd uh, collaborated on a few articles for In Goal as well. He had, yep. And very generously shared his knowledge with the goaltending community through us. So uh, definitely will be missed. I know he had a huge impact in British Columbia and uh, and wider as well. I think You know what I think to measure yeah. that impact? When we got the news, Hutch and I were together uh, late on Friday night and just at first just floored, but then our thoughts were of all the people that we knew that he had impact and making yeah. sure that they found out the right way. Um, you know, and that's, you know, like, and there, and, and we, the list, we just couldn't, it was so long, right? There were so many goalies we knew that had worked with him, um, that we, you, you know, you wanted to make sure that they found out, uh, and, and were delivered the news in the right way, especially young goalies that we knew. So it, it really it, impossible to measure the impact he's had on the goaltending community, not just here in the lower mainland, but beyond. And the Philadelphia Flyers, uh, uh, offering their thoughts to teammates and the family of Roman Chekmanic, uh, who was a, a goaltender of, uh, he had a shining star. It was brief, but it was a shining star in the National Hockey League. Uh, three years plus with the Philadelphia Flyers, finished up with the Los Angeles Kings, but he was the Flyers team MVP, won the Bobby Clark Award twice. Uh, it gives you an idea of, of uh, his uh, dominance and presence in the league. Uh, won a Jennings Trophy with Robert Esch. Uh, shared that with Martin Brodeur of the New Jersey Devils. Uh, how about that uh, that rivalry? And they both gave up wow. the the same amount of goals that year uh, between the Devils and the Flyers. I think it was 166. I don't know why that number sticks in in, in my head. But uh, Czech Manic was uh, he was he was a personality. Uh, he was so uh, one of those players that uh, during the shootout would do some unorthodox things uh, to to try and throw you off off your game. And went back and played in the Czech Republic. Uh, but one claim to fame is. He was, remember 1998, the first Olympics with NHLers, Dominic Hasek was the turning point in that Olympic Games, beats Canada in the shootout uh, in the semifinals, goes on to win uh, in uh, that beautiful gold medal game. It was Roman Cechmanek who was the backup to uh, Dominic Hasek in that uh, gold medal team uh, as well. So uh, a a bigger goaltender, uh, different style. Uh, and, and again, wasn't in the national hockey league for long. And you look back at some of his numbers and you wonder wh- why, uh, why he wasn't uh, around a little bit longer, but, uh, uh, another great personality. And, uh, uh, at a time when the Philadelphia Flyers were going through goaltenders like crazy, he, he had a pretty good run. And honestly, when you told me it was only for, like the, the period of time, and this is a little before my time in terms of playing close attention to the position, but I was shocked when you told me how short his NHL career was. Clearly, there was an impact there because even as somebody who wasn't paying that much attention to goaltenders, I remember Roman Chechmanic. So, um, in a short time, he had a big impact, and obviously, our thoughts go out to everyone that he knew, his friends, his family, his teammates, uh, and everybody impacted by his passing far too soon. He had trouble in the playoffs, so did the Philadelphia Flyers, uh, but uh, that was uh, his Achilles' heel when it came time to really follow through great regular seasons and then just uh, couldn't make it happen. Uh, Hutch, uh, uh, I don't know how close you followed Roman Czechmanic or that period of goaltending. I want to tell you what uh, really put him on a map. If you want to talk style, if you want to talk uh, your kit uh, and your setup, uh, he was the first one that I can remember going with a mirrored mask, that uh, that uh, silver wow. uh, look. Uh, had it in, in Philadelphia and then carried it over to Los Angeles. So uh, a little bit of uh, memory uh, of, of Roman Czech Manic. Uh, he had some flair. He had, uh, he had an ability to have a presence out there. That's uh, really impressive, Darren. I think you and a whole lot of our listeners are going to know a lot more about this time period than Woody or I did. Spencer Martin, right? Uh, he had the great uh, mask yes. with, with Vancouver and I think it's carried yeah, over it. to, to Columbus. Uh, I Song I'm not sure if it has. I know he wasn't allowed to wear it again here in Vancouver because no, the, the, it was the, li- the, the, a little too flat, a little yeah. too flashy for them here. But um, I love the look personally. Yeah. So if you if you're trying to wonder what I'm talking about, uh, think of Spencer Martin with uh, with the Vancouver Canucks and and that uh, that bucket. Uh, we also had a a very uh, shocking turn of events with the Edmonton Oilers in the last week with the demotion of Jack. Campbell. Now they've made a coaching change on top of that since, but the idea that Jack Campbell uh, was the first domino to fall, how surprised were we? I think we were surprised because 
at least by the numbers that Woody always shares with us, Jack was having um, the better season. Um, I guess the only thing that that maybe you can say is that a little bit more money gets moved down to the miners uh, with Jack and allows them to do that. But does and were they were they taking a flyer, hoping somebody might claim him, even though that's crazy? I mean, at the, at the end of the day, like it doesn't matter which one you move. You you save the cap savings are limited to just over a million dollars yeah. anyway. So. It's the same it's the amount. Same amount. I, sorry, I thought it was like a fraction. Yeah, no, it's, there it's you go. You know same more than amount. I do. Uh, the reality is, though, one guy in Skinner, uh, I believe, also has to clear waivers. He's not likely to clear or less likely to clear. Fair. Less and likely, And then you're, yeah. you're in a hole if you lose him. So, um, yeah, I'll put it this way, Darren. Jack was surprised. Um, I, had, uh, I was in on the first interview he did after he got down to Bakersfield. Um, part of a scrum post game after his first start with Abbotsford. And, you know, probably tough for him that Bakersfield is going through Canada after he gets sent down because now the spotlight's there. I mean, Sportsnet sent a camera just for that. Wouldn't normally be there uh, at an American Hockey League game. So a lot more attention on him as opposed to being able to just go down Bakersfield quietly, work on his game and work to get back. I caught up with him the next day. I wanted to get him outside of the scrum environment, have a really good chat. And yeah, he's surprised and I think a little bit hurt. And that first game, he looked a little bit shocked. Um, but what I was happy to hear in a very tough situation is it sounds like he's found some money and didn't want to share the name and that's fair. But he, since I think he said last April, he started working with someone and he didn't even say whether it was a sports psychologist, um, you know, mindset coach, we didn't put a label on it. He didn't put a label on it. I didn't press, but he's found somebody that's helped him sort of manage what has always been a difficult thing for them he's he's been his own worst critic and you know he talked about being not satisfied not happy like it's not like he's resting on his laurels but he felt good about parts of his game he felt felt good about his game even when they sent him down he felt good about his game despite the 873 save percentage when he went down and he he said like you know in the past like that's a step because in the past it wouldn't matter how well he thought he was playing those numbers he would have beat in his words he would have beat the beep out of himself and so to hear that he's learned to sort of not beat himself up i think bodes well for his chances of getting his feet under him finding his game and getting another opportunity those numbers i talked about the clear side analytics where we adjust for environment you know the last game against nashville and he talked about it there were goals where he would like to have played them differently um made different tactical decisions but at the end of the day, heading into that game, his numbers were exactly where they were the two years when he was in tr- Toronto. So um, I don't think, like, I don't believe it's all in the goaltending. Yes, the Oilers need some more saves in big moments, but nobody gives up more of the toughest chances off the rush than the Edmonton Oilers. They've got other problems. They don't have goaltending that's bailed them out when those other problems persist. Um, I'm just, above all else, I'm happy that to hear Jack talk like, He's not going to go down there and just absolutely beat himself up. He feels good about where his game is at. He did a lot of work with Dustin Schwartz last year. He talked about, you know, uh, some of the adjustments with Manny Legacy that he made after moving to Michigan. They worked together for not even a month, but some stance adjustments he was comfortable with. He felt okay about his game. He felt good about his game. And circumstances obviously aren't great. But I was just happy to hear that he seemed to be in a good spot because I worried about that. You worried about the person. Because everybody cheers for Jack Campbell, the person. And the position of goalie hasn't always been kind to Jack Campbell in terms of how he talks about and to himself uh, when he's in the media. And I just, I just, he seems like he's in a really good spot despite not being in the spot he wants to be in. And I like that for his chances of getting back. That's encouraging because we've watched Jack Campbell have some incredible highs. And when there's the dips, he is an open book, and there's been a couple of points where you watch that availability and you were concerned uh, about him taking on too much and, and putting too much on his shoulders. So to hear that evaluation from you, Woody, is really positive and gives you uh, some encouragement that he's going to be able to work his way out of this. I had a chance to talk to Glenn Healy, who now runs the NHL Alumni Association, former NHL goaltender. I believe he was the last guy to wear 30 for the New York Rangers before Henrik Lundqvist. Uh, but he's very happy to have Whoa. his number 30 going uh, to the Hall of Fame uh, it, uh, <laughs> with that. But he said uh, 
I, I asked him point blank about Jack Campbell and and what happens uh, with Skinner and Campbell going through the rough times. And he said, uh, uh, when when your things are going good, you're looking through a telescope and you can pick out every detail. And uh, it's it's unbelievable how it just uh, you don't even have to be searching out something. The the thing that you're looking for just comes into into perfect focus when things aren't going right the telescope is turned around and you're looking through the wrong end of the telescope and everything is super, super small and you can't find anything for the life yet. And even if you feel great about your game, you just uh, you have to give yourself time to work through it. So I don't know whether that's uh, something that you guys can relate to or not, but I thought it was an interesting way to digest what those two are going through. Also, guys, shouldn't forget a lot of people look at Jack Campbell as, I mean, Woody talked about we are concerned for the person and what he's going through. I think a lot of that is because Jack is such an open book with those feelings, as you both mentioned. Let's not forget all the other goaltenders who are going through this, who have spent their whole careers in hockey, uh, sort of told to push their emotions and what they talk about underneath. It's uh, There's a lot of goaltenders that probably struggle through situations like this. and. I don't know. To me, it's almost unfortunate that Jack gets labeled as a guy. I think some people think he's a little more fragile than the next guy because he cares to share his feelings with everybody. And uh, I just think we have to recognize everybody out there and what they're going through in these situations because uh, it's really hard to be a goaltender. Yeah, he should be applauded for being t- as yeah, much as as much yeah. as it's 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 put him in a spotlight. Sometimes I think he should be. And and I said like. Like, again, to me, the best part is we all need help processing this stuff, right? And he's got somebody that it sounds like has made a real difference to him personally. And when I talk to people who are around him, they feel like they can see that difference as well. And so support, right? He has a support mechanism for, you know, as he said to me, this would be a blow to anyone's ego to to go from being, you know, getting that contract to being in the NHL and on a cup contender to being sent down to the, to the AHL. And you know, I'm I'm there at practice a day later after a tough debut. I'm a little surprised they started him in that game. We're talking about that, Darren. Like he didn't get any ice. Okay, I didn't I didn't him. like it. If if you're gonna send him down to work on on your game, give him a chance. Give him give him a couple of uh, days of of practice, or to get adjusted, or to work your way through what was a shocking uh, development with your game. I I didn't like that part of it. The the whole having to make a move. It's pro sports. Somebody's going to take the the fall. A couple of people have now. Uh, I wasn't surprised that there was a transaction made, but not. I didn't like throwing him right in. Well, and he didn't. I don't think he loved the fact that he didn't get to practice because the Oilers practiced in Vancouver the day before his first start. The Bakersfield Condors didn't, and he didn't have the opportunity to be a part of that. They left him uh, out of practice. He was a UBC goaltender, and so I, I'm with you. That, that was a tough spot to get thrown in. But then at that morning skate, Jack's one of the first guys out. And then the next day at practice, he's one of the first guys out. He's out there um, with Sylvain Rodrigue and Oli Rodrigue working on their games. First guys out and just grinding away and with with a positive approach. And so to me, after all those emotions and after a tough first start in the American Hockey League to come back that next morning and the mindset that I didn't just see and how it manifested itself on the ice, that, but that he expressed in a quick conversation afterwards with me is just, listen, you just want good things for Jack Campbell. You can't help but want good things for Jack Campbell. And he's in a place where you feel better about his chances of finding those things right now. I should acknowledge too, somebody went up when when Jack went down. And I don't know what, what the plan is there, but it's an opportunity. Yeah, Calvin Picard. Sorry, a brain cramp. Um, yeah, and a guy that we've gotten to know. I've, I've been on the ice with, with, with Pick in Kelowna in the past. Um, just a great, really nice guy who's kind of, hung around and established yeah, himself in, as a, in the minor leagues and as a, as a reliable option, a guy who, so I, I'm curious too. I'm curious to see, I'm, listen, let's be honest. There's curiosity around the Oilers in a lot of respects. I talked about the numbers defensively. They are not even close to good enough. What they give up off the rush is just, just it's like bizarro world from last year. It's just night and day. And there's a lot of things that need to change there. With that comes some opportunity. It's nice to see Cal, you know, get that and let's see what he can do with it. Could Pickard ever do what Phoenix Copley did last year? Like I, I didn't see that coming. 
the two guys that started in LA a year ago are, are both gone. One's with the New York Rangers. And the other one went back in and, and won a game the other night uh, at, uh, at crypto.com arena, but for the Philadelphia Flyers. So uh, who knows? Uh, they'll, Edmonton's not going to be picky. Whoever stops the puck and, and gets done, they did win their last game. And then the coaching change uh, with Knobloch coming in for Jay Woodcroft. Uh, it's the In Goal Radio podcast uh, presented by The Hockey Shop, source for sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. I was on the website uh, the other night and they're doing a lot of great social things. I see it on my Instagram. Uh, they, they, the, the acting it could, could be better. And I'm willing to put on a, a bit of a, a seminar for them. Uh, just to to work on some of the hidden the marks and the lines and the inflections uh, in goals, fine to do that. But uh, but no, I love. Well, my- co- coaches often take the fall, so probably the director yeah. <laughs> here takes the fall on this one. Let's be not, honest. Not the just you; it's great. some of what what they're doing uh, at that. He's on not the, talking on the about shop Instagram. He is not talking about yeah. our segment. Touch no. our segments are worthy of Academy Award. I want to walk the red carpet. Me and Cam one day, if we get ever that get that big head of his down the red carpet. We're doing just fine. Well, Darren's, talk, Darren's talking about their other social media. It, the other social, uh, they, they put out a lot. So it's, it's like doing uh, like five movies a week is what they're doing. And it's hard to keep up. And mm-hmm. well, that, that's good. Uh, we'll publish it. Cut. Wrap. Let's go. Now, you, this week on the gear segment, you do go a little bit Hollywood because of the piece of gear that we're going to deal with and the, the, the tie-in with the, the Bauer agent twig. Well, there is, I know there's a lot of discussion out there on the internets about who the next James Bond will be in the big series. All I have to say is head to YouTube this week to see this gear segment because Cam has his demo reel ready. Cam thinks maybe he's the next James Bond. And this is totally factual. I don't think I'm telling anything out of school. Uh, We're too cheap to use the James Bond music. All right, we're we're not going to pay for it. So there might be if if you sense a resemblance to the humming coming from from Woody, it's I think it's purely coincidental. But if if it's in your head that it might be some James Bond stuff, that's good on you. But it, but it was not. You got somebody with Woody's pipes. Yeah, you got to go with I, it. I don't think it was intended to be James Bondish at all. So lawyers over there, just uh, take our word for it. It was just we we're just having some fun, and it just happened to come out sounding like. 007 music there's there's i couldn't carry a tune or hit a beat to save my life so there's no way anybody's gonna mistake this for anything that was real as as we're having fun as we're having fun here just for the record you're not don't go searching for james bond music as you're listening to this segment on the podcast head over to youtube there's more there yeah this is one this is one you want to watch for sure it's the bauer agent stick light beyond light like if you drop it it floats down to the ice. It doesn't fall down to the ice. Like air. air. Here's Cam. Welcome back to the Hockey Shop Source for Sports. I'm here in Goalie Utopia with Cam Matwiv. Agent Cam Matwiv. Agent Cam Matwiv, because we've got the new Bauer Agent Stick. It may be November, but it's like Christmas around here because there's still new gear coming in, including this. Now, hope like Agent, we'll get to that in a minute. And your <laughs> swell outfit, Boron. As soon Boron. As, as soon as I saw that this the the call out on this was Boron, I immediately went to chemistry. The, no, actually, to be honest with you, I I thought. This was named after their pro rep, Tim Boron, who's one of the one of the great pro reps who we who we met here and works with NHL guys like Jake Ottinger. And I thought they just named a they named a stick after him. Are you telling me that's not the case? Tim, big shout out today on the podcast, but no, it's not actually. You deserve a shout out. <laughs> so Boron, if we go back to our periodic table of elements. Oh, I was told there'd be no chemistry. Yeah, it's okay. It's a quick, quick lesson. Happens to be right to the left of carbon. So boron in its actual chemical state is like a powder. So how do we synthesize this and turn it into a carbon-like material? Well, we'll leave that to Bauer. But what that means for your goal stick is carbon-like performance with a lighter weight material, strong, lightweight, very rigid as well. 
The one thing I noticed about this gold stick is that it is quite stiff versus Bauer's in the past. Now it is listed as an 87 flex, and Bauer lists that on almost all of their gold sticks. However, we go to go put some weight into this. Yeah, like that's Kevin's really horking on that, and it's not going anywhere. And I'm strong, <laughs> strong, just like the stick, like bull. Yes. So back towards other features of this stick. So this carries some of the vapor uh, geometry and feel wise that we've seen in the past. So quick call outs there is the pentagram. So quite a few goalies, including myself, really, really like that extended up finger grab. I like how it brings the index finger across the, the um, upper portion of the paddle, which gives me very, very good control in terms of for deflecting pucks and also how the puck rides off that stick. I feel like you just have a better control over it. Shorter shaft, again, for that ease of playing the puck so you can, can get more torque. That's why Kevin looked like he flexed that stick so much um, with that shorter shaft because you're not bringing your elbow up as high to be able to grab that puck off the boards and also put some flex into it. Hey, what is a quad ridge paddle technology? It's written in an interesting spot here. Hard to see on the camera, but hey, what's that? So quad means how many? Four. So there would be four ridges on the inside of that paddle. I was also creating... told there'd be no math. <laughs> it's a great, better reinforcement for the paddle of the stick. Again, increasing that overall stiffness profile, but also strength of the stick itself. Okay, so I, I noticed on the... Uh... Like it feels like it's it's slimmer up top and then yes. sort of fattens up a little bit at the hand. Correct, tapered. Ta tapered, that's a good, wow, you're like, you're like the smartest guy ever today. It's a tuxedo. Wow. Um, it is light as, like it is light. Yes, so Bauer claims it's light as air. I, I, I mean, like air is pretty light last time I checked. So, I mean, I think this weighs a little bit more Not than much. air. Not much. Not much. Have what? you weighed it? Uh, you know what? For Mr. Smart Guy here, I actually don't have that weight, but we'll, we'll post that somewhere thanks to some severe editing from our big guy in the background. All right. So, but I, I would like to call out, as usual, with goalies and all of the stuff that we have, for whatever reason, we like to spell things really weird. See, that was the, I was finally going to stump you with that yeah. one. What's the five? Agent. Ag five, ag, ag five. Ag, you don't know what the five means. Agent goal stick here at the hockey shop and at thehockeyshop.com, 604-589-8299 or 1-800-567-7790. Give us a call, we can chat about the goal stick. Another cool, quick call out, 24 inch is a senior size. Um, they've started to bring that down. Um, again, with general trends that we have season, are seeing in terms of for paddle sizing, those are- uh, Loren Bersois could use this stick. There you go. Right off the shelf. Absolutely. He's a power guy, he uses a 24 inch paddle. And he would love an Augen stick. Okay, so uh, one last quick question because you've gone over all these features and I just can't get over how light this is. Like, I don't even, I don't even, it's so pretty too that I don't even want to hit you with it, which is rare. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, P31 curve. Square toe? Square toe. All standard? All standard. Can you order it custom? Negative. Okay. So you've already sold through a lot of these. Make sure you yes. check that out, folks, online at thehockeyshop.com. They've got more coming in because they've been so popular. I gotta be honest with you because I didn't know what boron was. I was like, what's the deal? Now that I've had it in my hands, I get it. It's incredibly light. And even if it's not named after Tim, it's still a pretty cool name. And you know what? I think that's a perfect time to make my agent exit. A lot of talk about weight. I get uncomfortable around weight. But did you ever weigh it? We did, and the weight will be displayed on the YouTube video, so make sure you go smash that like button and hit the subscribe and watch our YouTube video with Cam. But for those listening, we do want to tell you that that sucker weighs 1.25 pounds. And by God, not only does it only weigh a little more than a pound, it is balanced beautifully. It doesn't feel weighted heavily at the bottom. It is just... Uh, yeah. it's unbelievable how light that is. We talk about, oh, it's the lightest stick that so-and-so has ever made, or this is their lightest stick. Honestly, I think this is the lightest stick I've ever held in my hands. For all you Canadian physics students, that's 567 grams. Player stick way. Oh, come on, Darren. We don't care about players. And truthfully, that's a great truthfully, question. We, truthfully, like we don't know. I <laughs> I, that's where I thought you were going at first, and then then I I was 
buying into your like, uh, come on, like we don't care about those guys, but uh, oh, we just don't know. So the uh, the Bauer agent player stick weighs three hundred and thirty five grams. Wow. The goal stick is five hundred and sixty six grams. So not half, but we're getting there. I was just disappointed. I saw that I saw this hype about Bauer agent and boron and i thought they just named it after tim boron turns out it's actually like on the elemental table of periodic whatever we did in high school right next to carbon and it's just lighter is it too light no that's 0.74 pounds. 0.74 pounds the player stick the player and stick, 1.25 yeah. pounds is the bow agent for the goal stick. stick yeah so basically you can never say oh boy does this stick feel heavy it's it's insane, Darren. It's insane. Like I think the tape you would put on that stick weighs as much as the stick itself. No, you, I I don't think you're wrong. It would be interesting to give it a good sock how, tape job. How and did weigh you it again. how did you weigh it? I'm I'm just curious from like like from a just processing on a scale. Canada's leading online retailer of goal equipment, the hockey shop. Scales. Has a mail room in the back. We went into the mail room as they were packing up all the orders. They've got a large scale because you need to weigh things so Canada Post knows what to charge them or whichever courier they yeah. use. And the boys put the stick on there. We've got a bit of that in the video okay. as well this week, Darren. You can actually see the back room a little sometimes bit. Sometimes like you, you, to, to, to weigh a bike, you hang it from a scale. Uh, We've done that. We've done that yeah. before with sticks as well. We just... What do we just use some thread or something to tie it to the little hanger? Yeah. But in this case, it was on Thank a scale. You. Thank you for that. They won't mm -hmm. let me you are very know welcome. the codes to the, uh, the postal scale at my office. Because they're worried you're going to order gear. I, I, but I'm not sending it out. I want to bring it in. That's, that's, People that's, use that's mail. Fair. fair. What are you sending stuff for? Yeah. Hey, well, I'm not sending anything to anybody. Maybe the odd letter, like I want to send my dad. Autograph pictures. Card. Surely you get a lot of requests autograph for autograph pictures. pictures. Yeah, for sure. In goal. In goal autograph pictures. I think all listeners to the podcast should send a note to Vegas asking for an autograph picture of Darren Millard. I was, uh, I was out. Did I just cause trouble there? I was there? out the other day, and I'm not going to lie to you. I sent you guys a screenshot. I looked good the other day at practice. You, you, you did. You did. We were very jealous. Gotta by should we publish that with this Especially episode? Especially those of us who haven't been on the ice for like coming up on six weeks now i was very jealous what was that hot is this going in the show notes yes. darren oh, oh yeah look good. yeah that i can put your picture the up in the oh, show you notes look good. you look good all right darren you said it it's going my mask looks check out great. the show notes in goldmag.com everybody darren yeah. you ready you're going i'm going uh good, we've got you're uh, going our feature interview brought to you by sensorina sensorina vr uh and nikita Kowapilo is coming up, uh, Belarusian, and we want to get to his conversation in just a little bit. But first, uh, the latest from Sense Arena, Hutch. Sense Arena, as I think everybody knows now, is now known as NHL Sense Arena because they got a great affiliation with the National Hockey League now. We know Devin Levi, fantastic goaltender, uh, had a great game just the other night is an avid user of Sense Arena. And so now we've got this formal partnership between the National Hockey League and Sense Arena. So you can get in there. You can play as your favorite goaltender. You can hang out in the locker room for your favorite team. You can compete now against other goaltenders in Sense Arena. So there's a whole lot of fantastic stuff in there in the newest release. And you know, one of the things I love about Sense Arena is that they're always updating it. You get a membership so that you can use the software for a year fantastic deal and you get to see these periodic updates as they come through at the year so you get new training plans you get new drills you're becoming a better goaltender all along and then they're working to make the product even better for you so if you want to face face nhl shooters you want to face great power play setups you want to do some new neurocognitive drills you want that little thing to add to your game every single day this year sensoring is a great thing to add boys just 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day. Imagine the leg up you're getting on your competition who's at home, probably sitting on the couch playing video games. Let's be honest. But you're out there making saves. You're not adding any extra stress to your body. You're seeing shooters that your buddies are not seeing in practice, unless you happen to be Darren Millard and you get to face the Stanley Cup champions in practice. The only way you're going to do it is with Sensorina. So grab Sensorina today. If you've already got 
um, the great MetaQuest headset, then you can just download a trial version right now. Give it a go. I'm actually going to be online with our friends from Sense Arena tomorrow talking about this new release and some ways that we can share news about it with the InGoal family. So listen for more next week, boys. Thank you to Sense Arena for sponsoring all our feature interviews. Woody, tell us about Nikita. He big. <laughs> Sick. Were you looking up or are you looking I down? I was Woody? definitely looking up. Even when we were both sitting down after practice for the Abbotsford Canucks, um, it was good to catch up with Nikita. I had a chance to talk with him at development camp and again at Canucks training camp shortly, just sort of casually shooting the breeze. And um, I mean, this is a guy that maybe not a lot of people know about, but by the end of last season, after a breakout in Sweden, he was pretty sought after. He had multiple options. He chose to come to Vancouver and now he's in the process of making some changes to his game and working on his game. And um, it just, to me, was a great opportunity to find out a little bit about his background uh, in Belarusia, how he got started in the game. Interesting story there. How he ended up in Switzerland as a teenager, then Russia, then Sweden, and now Vancouver and the steps he took along the way. So uh, fascinating discussion with a very large, very agile for his size and and has a nice set of hands too, goaltender who has had some little bit ups and downs in his first pro season in the American Hockey League. Um, but you see in those ups some real potential for a guy who could be in the National Hockey League within a couple of seasons and a real option for the Vancouver Canucks down the road. So uh, thanks to Nikita for catching up and I hope the rest of you enjoy it. Feature interview brought to you by Sense Arena, Sense Arena BR, NHL Sense Arena on In Goal Radio, the podcast. Really excited to welcome to the Ingle Radio Podcast. First time guest, although we have chatted once before, just not for this format, Nikita yeah. Tolapilo. First year in North America. First off, welcome. Yeah, thank you. What's the biggest adjustment been like coming over here? Uh, I think like for me, it's not super hard because I was uh, last year's uh, play aboard my home country, like in Sweden. So I'm kind of used to it, you know, how it's going. Of course, it's like a different different side of the world you know but like uh, the biggest uh, change for me i think it's like uh, uh, time difference because it's like uh, 10 11 hours from my uh, hometown so it's like a little bit compl complicated to have a connection with the friends family back home so it's like just i think that's the biggest biggest change for me what about the hockey side uh for hockey it's like i mean like it's uh, i think it's like it's for sure it's like the different hockey like compare Sweden because Sweden it's like uh, they still use the biggest ice you know like bigger ice so it's like uh, I feel it's like more uh, more skill hockey maybe if I can say it like that it's like uh, the guys have like more time there you know like they can have a uh, more play place uh, and here it's like I would say it's like faster hockey it's like the things change pretty fast here like uh, and uh, a lot of special for goalies I think you have to be like sharp during the whole game, like, because it's, like, can be, like, a lot of scramble, like, uh, around the net and, like, chips, bounce, that stuff. So, like, I think that's uh, the biggest difference. That big ice over in Sweden, I've heard, I heard guys say, like, there's so much time, say, the puck's on the board. Yeah. It takes a while to get yeah, to you, yeah. and, and the play's not as direct. Yeah. With the play being more direct, with pucks being on top of you so quickly here in traffic, how do you have to adjust? Like, what is the adjustment for you, technically or tactically? Uh, I would say like uh, it's like all about the, your pace. You kind of that's what we talk uh, a lot with the uh, Ian and uh, Marco. It just like uh, kind of from when I came to like summer camp or something, like try to uh, uh, help yourself to get that pace. You know, during the games, like always beat the pass, beat the guy, like be in front of him, like you know, like it's. Because, yeah, as I said, like in the, in the, on the big guys, it's like you have more time a little bit, but at the same time, the guys have more time to make a play too. So it's like two ways, you know. So, but uh, here, like, it's just, I, I just try to, you know, like raise up my pace, you know, during the game, like post pace, like before shots, like that stuff. So I feel that's uh, most important. Pace, pace, pace. It's a fast game over yeah. here. Yeah. Um, let's, let's rewind a little bit. How'd you become a goalie? Uh, I think like I was like a player. I start start practice maybe at four, four years old as a goalie. No, 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 oh, just, just skating. Like, just okay. skating, yeah. And then like 
I just have like uh, good genetic with the uh, like uh, stretching, like uh, I'm I stretch flexible. Pretty, yeah, flexible, yeah. So uh, I, I remember like uh, we have like off ice and the we have like stretch after ice or something, and then the like the coach so like I have a be best uh, flexibility like in the team. So he he just said like hey, you should be the goalie. But I actually I don't remember if I because he told me later like. I, my parents was not really happy with that, <laughs> especially father. But I'm not sure because I I don't remember that. So and then like I became the goal and like I think that I'm, I was a big guy always. So it as was, you say, speaking of genetics, six yeah, foot yeah, six. <laughs> yeah, and like uh, yeah, I was the big guy, biggest guys uh, in the team. Like and uh, I think it's uh, especially when you're young, it helps you a lot. Like you know, like it's you like the guys can shoot, so you cover like uh, a lot of net of the net and. Uh, that's how I started playing, and I think the the things like goes pretty well for me. Like since I was a kid, so I just like you know like start to yeah start to get uh, some skills, you know, like uh, year by year. Okay, so growing up in Belarus, as you become a goalie, when do you start getting coaching? I'm just curious because we see it all over yeah. the world. It's different. Like here in North America, guys will have coaches at like seven, eight years old, goalie specific. Yeah. When did you start to get that side of the game at it? Uh, I would say like. Like the goal is specific, like we have like kind of not a goalie coach. Like I think we have like my coach. He was maybe he was playing like a little bit like for like for fun, like a goalie. So we do something. But I think like when I like was around like twelve, thirteen years old, then like we got like real goalie coach who like who was like uh, like he played like a goalie before. Then we start have like some. I think maybe one goalie ice session with a bunch of kids like every 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 year like you know like so it's like probably like 20 25 goalies we have a goalie ice. but then it's like you know 12 13 14 it's like getting more and then like i move uh i moved to switzerland like when i was uh when i was 15 and that was like my uh there i started like learn like kind of like a lot like uh, from uh from my goalie coach they more were technical sure. yeah it's like it, it's, it was more like yeah you just have more time with the goalie coach you know because like when i was back home it was like i think we have like maybe only one goalie coach or two for all kids like you know like i don't know how many teams we have like maybe like you know 12 teams and so it's only it's it's tough to to get a lot like uh focus on you so it's and when i moved to switzerland it was like we had a goalie coach who was working with the first team under 20 and the under 17 so it's like was my, what, uh, way more uh, focused on you so you start to watch the games you know like talk a lot about that stuff video yeah, doing video, reviews yeah, yeah. a little you know, more professional yeah like like more professional exactly i would say like that and so that was 2015 16 so you said you were 14 15 years old yeah around i was that? 15 i think yeah that's like that's pretty young to be moving to an entire different country was it pu purely for hockey that yeah you moved? yeah yeah just for hockey yeah i mean like yeah it was tough for sure because like that was the first time i've uh, moved from my family and uh, i moved there like i was like uh alone I, I don't really know english at that time and like yeah no russians like guys i can't speak my own english so it was like super tough like you like miss the home so much like it's and uh but like that's I mean, like, since that moment, I understand that, like, if I want to be, like, play at a high level, be successful, like, that's only the way how I should, uh, how I can get there. So it's, you have to uh, get something to to get back, you know, like, so it's... Sacrifice. Uh, yeah, sacrifice, kind of, yeah. So you, you pay your price for some. So that's, it's tough for sure, but, like, that's uh, part of our job, and especially if you're from my country, it's... It's for us, it's way more tougher than for other guys. So at what point did you, I'm guessing it's around that age, but at what point did that, like, when did you start to think, hey, like, this is a dream I want to chase? Like you said, making those sacrifices with an eye towards this, to being on an NHL contract with an NHL team. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, like, I was, like, in a like, uh, young age, I was always kind of, like, best goal in tournaments, like, everywhere. Like, I, like, it's uh, kind of, like, you can see like okay if you put more like to work if you came to a good spot you you can be like pro goalie like and that's and then like i um 
play some tournament and like some agent like called my parents he said okay like i, I see like a lot of uh, potential in nikita like he's like uh young and like like you have like three four years still draft and so uh i think it's good like first uh, our uh thought was to go to finland but uh with finland was it's like you have to kind of pay for your like living there you know and my like i'm not from rich family so we're not uh, we can't do that so and goal is expensive yeah and like uh then we i'm super happy because like usually like it doesn't work like that everywhere like uh, I, I met some guys like from latvia or, like other countries who play in switzerland and like they all of them pay for for living there like maybe like thousand euro or something like that a month but uh for me team like uh, they saw me and then like they said yeah we want this guy and we will pay for him like we will pay for all, all everything like they like, saw my parents didn't pay nothing so that was the uh, most important thing and then same time like i said the goalie coach there was he he was like former nhl uh uh player uh, yeah. David uh, Abisher. Oh, David, Abisher. we yeah. know David Abisher yeah. well. I, yeah. I covered him when he was with Colorado. Yeah, for sure. he was a Colorado uh, Canadians and that. So that was like uh, I was super happy, you know, to work with the, that kind of guy. You know, like just to to like he explained me a lot. You know, like in the mental stuff. You know, that like it's like so. Can you remember? Give me, give me if you can. I know I'm asking yeah. you to go back quite a ways because everybody that's listening here is goalies. Yeah. yeah parents coaches and young goalies yeah. when we talk about advice from a guy like david abisher mental do you remember any is there anyone that sticks out to you that you can pass I, I along think I can stick, like stick in my head like uh, i remember like i we was like it was some, some meeting with him and he tried to explain me what's the difference between the goalie in nhl who makes like two million and like five millions and like he said like they like probably like they have the same skills but like the guy who make like five millions make like one extra save or like you know important save and then like i remember like every time when when he said like you start to play you see the other goal in other net and you have to have in your like in your mind in your head like you have to talk to yourself like i'm a better than him like i'm a better i want to take it like so it's just like you just prepare yourself like kind of you you're better than other goalie like you want to beat him like and that stuff so that's like stick with me like i, I really remember that when he said like all the time when you go there you see the other goal in an opposite side and you just have to say like i'm a better than him like so that's a good it's, it's interesting to hear that mentality because yeah. whenever we ask goalies oh yo hey you're playing a great goalie at the other side a lot of them say well I, i'm not shooting on him right yeah. but like you can embrace that sort yeah, of yeah, as a way always, to challenge yourself yeah you always challenge yourself yeah you always like try to, i mean like everyone's different you know right but like you just in your for, for yourself you have to like have a good confidence and you have to like understand like you you can beat everyone you know if you're not confident in yourself it's tough to to, to do something and also i and like when you that type of uh, goal is said you when he was successful you know like you, you're like yeah that makes sense you know like so because i felt like mentality for goalies is like it's probably like 85 percent so it's like i mean like everyone can skate everyone can stop box like uh, i heard stories from a goalie coaches like they have like super good goalies in the practice like it was unbelievable and then they came to the games and like they can show up because it's pressure that stuff like so i think like mentality it's it's really important for goalie have you ever worked with a mental like with a skills coach or with a psych sports psychologist uh, on this side of actually it? not that much like a couple times so but like i try to you know like try to uh oh it's called like i read the the books you know like psychology that stuff like uh Got a favorite uh, no i can understand like i can say like in english because it's like in russian so okay and, like i watch like some like you know like uh even like clips you know like that stuff it's like because when you're getting like uh when you're younger you like don't really understand like how it's important but like because like uh, like it's it's too much like you know like it's going on around you and you can't control that stuff and like you have to kind of stay in your own babble you know like it's uh, and it's like you just start uh, like understand that like when you grow up so I, I but i not really like i never work a lot like with the mental coach but maybe i should start <laughs> well it sounds like you've i mean you've embraced it already the idea yeah, of it yeah yeah i like really like really like, understand that so you know some for some people like uh it's good to talk to someone maybe some guys can like you know like like for me it's even like uh, good to talk to my like girlfriend like you know like it's like it helps you too you know when you can say okay 
like that's going on like uh, like it's like something happened then like you hear back for her like and you know it just it's just important to talk to someone it's can be like uh like psychology guy you know like or like mental coach or like maybe your parents maybe your friends but just like not it's tough to keep your like everything inside you know like so no i love it i love yeah. it um you end up going back to the K plane in dynamo in the khl yeah. was that experience like again like you know just from a playing standpoint yeah. style of game but also coaching what kind of you know what was the coaching like there uh i think it was it was kind of like uh it was the part of development. I, I went back from after Switzerland to national teams. We have like a program like kind of like USA have like we have like under seventeen, under eighteen, and under twenty at that time. When right. you so you playing against like when you're like nineteen, you play against first like first like Belarusian league, but like still it's like all guys with this experience and the stuff to play there. When you're nineteen, you know like you usually we get beat like every time. You know maybe we won like a couple of games in a year or so, and after that when. Uh, I was like 19, I uh, signed a contract with the KHL, like two way. Like, I uh, obviously I understand I like probably will not play a lot, like, but it was a good thing to first of all practice with the like that's uh, the, the guys, like, and then like play a lot of games in the uh, Belarusian League. But at uh, the same time, it was like, it was a little bit tough because uh, usually they, uh, they have a three goalies in a row, this, you know, so you're like a third goalie. You don't, get, you don't get a lot of practice, you know, like, and especially like, if it's like some old goalies there, you like just sit in the in corner, you know, so it's tough. And, uh, but same time, I was uh, happy, like, uh, I get my maybe five, six starts in the first year. I can't say like it was super successful, but same time, you know, you're just like uh, happy to get this type of games, you know, like just to like understand like you can play against like top players in the league you know like that's was like maybe some of them like top players in the world so it's it was nice but uh then like my second year i i kind of understand for myself that uh that's not a way where i should go like it's uh like i really like i believe i was believed that i can uh i worth more than i get so and uh I understand like if i stay there for if i resign my contract i'm probably will be gone you know like i will be play somewhere there like in the russian league or something so in my second year when i like came closer to like february or something you know like then i decided to find a new agent to try to go to europe so uh, then i find my swedish like luckily for me i find a good agent yeah and then you ended up in sweden for two years yeah now, um, a league and, and a country where we hear a lot about the goalie coaching there. What changed for you? What did you learn there that might have been different from the lessons you'd learned along the way? Because I think as goalies, we're constantly evolving, right? Yeah. What was uh, the lessons there? Obviously, like, that's changed my uh, game, like, like totally. Like, I, I, I have, like, uh, I think I, I have some uh, genetics, you know, I have some reads. I, I maybe, like, uh, flexibility, like, uh, like, strength you know like but same time it's like you have to put it like all all together you know like right. kind of in the box so in, the, in your book and uh, when i came there like i have like some good thing but I, it was like not together you know and when i came there it's like take uh, maybe first half year you know to put it together put the thing together like and then i i start seeing improves like after new year you know like and i uh, yeah it was it was tough. First half season was tough for sure, but uh, then it's like you get uh, kind of price back, you know. Like so, it was it was nice experience. When you talk about putting all those things together, it's like it sounds like a game plan almost. Like yeah, it, knowing when to do what. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, it's kind of yeah. I, I said you know like like uh, when the, my goalie coach uh, scouts me like before I sign in the, in uh, Sweden like they like the like agent like everyone like who watched me they like was like yeah like this guy have a potential to be an NHL goalie like he is like he just have like kind of like he's just a lot of like tools like to great like but like you just need to you know like put it together like I uh, organize you organize yeah like you know, your game plan have a game plan like uh, and because i was like super wide i'm overworking you know i like and then like i we start talk a lot like first and most importantly you know like it's uh, we make my box game you know like i'm not like overworking i'm not like over sliding like i was like 
so kind of start try to stay tight you know and uh yeah and then like when your game became like solid you know in the box then you can uh when you came like became like looks like a solo then you can you know like start to work in some extra thing you know but first first a couple months like we just work in the ba basic stuff you know like so when you say in a box like we think of box control yeah, box control you always go to the post post to post rebound go to post not not overworking like not over sliding like to like overlap and then like all nets it's empty so like be like solid goal you know like like for uh, like read and react you know not like go like too early down you know try to like uh, trust your like like skills trust your like reaction you know like so that's like simple stuff Did you sort of play a little deeper I mean, yeah. it sounds like you you were sounds like you're playing a more neutral game yeah it's like because like it seems like you know like i was like super like kind of aggressive you know like okay it can be like the shot rebound and then you go like so far out and then like if it's some some another play then you like uh it's empty net or something so it's just, just to be like more like you know like compact you know that stuff and uh yeah it's it's take a couple months for me you know but i'm i'm like super happy to to get that opportunity to came to sweden it's like because it's like a really good goalie goal is there and a goalie coach like it's it's one of the best like obviously and like it's it's nice to see you know how they like every guy like every team like they like they like so smooth you know like they move so good like so calm like it's yeah, it's nice now second year you had great success there yeah. When do you start hearing from teams and your agent talking about coming over? Because it sounds like there were a number of teams interested. Yeah. What was that process like? I think like like obviously it was pretty early, maybe after my five eight games. Oh wow! Yeah, it was super early. Yeah, and like I get first team who reached me out and said like, "What's your plan for next year? You want to come over?" And like, and that uh, moment I was like kind of. I was always like looking for North America, like that was my goal. This is so, the goal. Yeah, 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 that was my goal. So I was sure, like that. In some moment, I I want to go there. We get like a, even after my first year, we get some uh, opportunity, but it was only like HL deal, and we like decided it's like too early. I was not ready for that, and like it was better to play a bunch of games in the street and like get again, like get better, get uh, like confidence, and then uh, when the teams uh, start talk to me, like. First of all, my agent, my Swedish agent, he was still, he like thought like maybe it's better to play one more year in Sweden in SHL or like uh, somewhere like in, uh, and then they came uh, to North America. So it was in the beginning and then uh, when the things, when the season move on, like was like December, and then like we get another like two or three teams, you know, they was kind of like pushing hard, like, and then we was okay, like probably that's a good time, you know, like uh, to get that opportunity so the only thing was like to find the the best the best direction where we go so we just start to talk with the teams then like with the first of all couple teams then like another couple came and then like uh, i think before uh, march when the deadline in nhl uh, was closer then we start to actually try to decide where we want to go because like some teams was they was pushing super hard. They said you have a couple of days to tell us if you go with us or not, because we want to trade someone or not. So it, and then like yeah, then we decide okay, like where we want to go. How'd you pick here? What were the factors that led you to Vancouver? Uh, I would say like because uh, we have like uh, I have a couple of meetings with the Ian, and then uh, uh, I know the Mike Samuel, and the development coach. He was my GM in Sweden for the first year. So I, I, we we really good like kind of relationship with him like we stay in touch and then like also I, I talked to him before I signed like he explained me how it works your organization like and I heard only the good thing about that but the but the most important thing it was like Ian Clark because I I I mean like I heard about him like before like I like I didn't even talk about Vancouver but I know him like that he's like really good coach like and like and then when they came with the offer you know like and you choose between other teams and like but i think that was the most important because i felt like that that uh that can help me a lot like i can make a, lo a lot of steps like to improve my game so 
Yeah, that's why. It's been a lot of hard work with Marco Terranius yeah. and also at camps with Ian. What's been the biggest adjustment? What are you still working on? What's How do you feel it's going? Because it's there's a lot of new things that they introduced to their goalies. Yeah. How do you feel it's it's sort of incorporating into your game at this point? Yeah, I think like first first month was pretty tough because it's like a lot of new information. Like, but because uh, uh, it, it's you have your own kind of you're not like super young, you know. You have your own like thing. You have your own game. Like kind of you're like, and especially when you play good, you know, you're like it's tough to change something, you know. Right. But then, like, when you start, like, used to it, like, use it in a practice, then it's, like, you see improve, like, in the games, and then you're, like, start release. Yeah, that's, like, makes sense. And then, like, you just, it, it's still, like, I think the biggest one was, like, the pace. Like, yeah. And uh, they want me, I'm, they want me to be, like, have a good pace, but same time be calm, like, as myself, not, like, lose it too, you know? So it's, like, uh, and for me, it was, like, a little bit tough because I, I felt like I, after Sweden, I play like super calm and all like so, like and here's like it was a little bit different, but I I can see now like and I can say like that my pace is getting better. Like still like we work a lot on like rotation, you know that stuff like uh, uh, exits like uh, but like I would say, I would say like it's getting better and better and like I'm happy with the progress and I think they uh, they happy to tough balance right like. We want you to pay, play faster with pace yeah. and be ahead of everything, yeah. but still be calm. Yeah, like that's it, like in a, some ways, it's kind of yeah. like a little bit of a mind twist. Yeah. Like, those don't add up. Yeah, that's what I thought too first time. Like I was like, how it's how it's possible? It's <laughs> like, and, but then you understand like what that means. It's, it means not the pace. It doesn't mean like overworking. It's like as I said in the beginning, you just like like that type of game. What the, like we play here in North America, it's like uh, you just want to be like ahead the game a little bit not behind the game that, that's most important you don't have to like overwork and, like but you just want to beat the every pass if you have a chance every pass be like uh, faster than the player like and then like if first yeah first time like first month i don't understand like it was like super confused in my head you know because you like it's it's new thing a lot of new thing and like you have like too much information you had but now it's like you don't want to be thinking when you're yeah, playing. Yeah, you just like, yeah, you just like used to it. And it's like, it, and then you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What about technically anything? Is like, you talk about exits, entries, there's yeah, some different like, ways of doing things here. Uh, no, really. I would say just like, yeah, like the most important, just like do everything like pretty fast, you know, right. like, and like the kind of the, how, how they say it's like, uh, work first, rest second, like not like rest and then work. Like, so that's like most like, Sometimes I'm like, even now, like I, I can like we watch some games, so, and if it's like some close play, like quick rebound, I'm 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 pretty quick, I'm, I'm faster, you know, I'm recover fast. But sometimes when it's like I, I see the like it's not red there, not, nothing dangerous, the puck somewhere like in the corner, then I can like a little bit like chill like before. But like it's like it's just a habit, so I try to to work in that like in the practice you know like and like recovery like quick to position and that stuff so just make that quick to position a mindset yeah, yes exactly which, which is i mean it doesn't happen overnight yeah but you just you know like you try to do that in a, in a practice and then like when you came to the game you don't think about that it just like you know like you have like a habit uh, anything surprised you about being over here in terms of whether it's the rinks the atmosphere no, the games I I mean, like, yeah, you played the, at a high level already. Yeah, I think like the atmosphere, like it's a different. I mean, like in the Europe, the people more loud. It's, yeah, they sing in uh, and yeah, chanting and they cheer yeah. for you. It's like I think they give like the it's they give you a lot of uh, adrenaline there, and especially like a lot of like uh, every every team almost have a derby, you know, like which yeah. is like super crazy, like you know, like the fun, like when you when you know, okay, like we have a derby game it's like it's something different like everyone like super hot like two teams hot it's like we just enjoy the time there but here it's like a little bit different type of uh fans like a little bit more quiet you know like but same time it's like it's a it's like okay. i mean like we and i don't really focus on that but uh yeah but otherwise i i think like it's all good and nothing really surprised me here a lot because it's like same puck, same net, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, same net, same puck. Yeah. Um, last one, is there, like, is there anyone I didn't ask you when you were growing up, like, did you have a guy? 
Like, did you watch the NHL? Uh, did you have a guy yeah. that you wanted to be or that you modeled your game after? Yeah, I, I can say I model my game, but uh, I'm, uh, I am I like how the Pecorino plays, you know, how he play with the puck, you know, like how he uh, how he moves. Like, he was like maybe like same size as me, but he was super athletic, like super like fast and like play like, and he was actually in the lockout season in Minsk. So I was, uh, I was walk, looking at him like uh, back home. Like and I think in the World Cup and 2014 he was there too, so it was nice to see him. And I didn't, I can't say I watch a lot of games because like it's tough to, it's like two different times. But like yeah, I, I for sure I was like him a lot. Like so yeah, but I I can't say I'm Kobe him, but because I even remember like I was uh, working with my goalie coach like in Belarus and like he said like you can't be like Rina, like you just different, like you like. You like you said you're like more like a Koskinen, and I was oh okay thank you. <laughs> now listen, though I will say this is because you talked about going to Sweden and sort of the box control and playing a little more conservatively. Like it was interesting to me. Like Pekka, it was funny because when UC went to Nashville, Pekka realized like hey, like this guy's quite a bit smaller than me, yeah, and he's playing less aggressively. Okay, like I think there was a, for Pekka like, and you look at the success he had sort of after like yeah. and, the, and the Vesna Trophy and stuff. He recognized the need to as athletic as he was, maybe not rely on it as often as he used to. So yeah. that, it's part of an evolution every big goalie goes through, I think. Yeah, exactly. Like, and like, you want to use your size like as much as possible, you know, like, and uh, yeah, I mean, like everyone have a different like tools, you know, like some guys have a great reaction, like uh, Henrik, you know, like he, like he can stay in that, probably save the pucks, but some guys like play just, you know, like super aggressive, you know, emotional, like so. We're just trying to kind of, and I feel like I'm, uh, I, I'm getting like, I'm a not a slow goalie. So I, and if I have my tools and I can bring another good tools to my like kind of book, then it's like, uh, I really believe that I, it's can help me to be successful. Uh, well said. Listen, I really appreciate the time. I really enjoyed the conversation. I yeah, know our audience you. is going to get lots from it. So thank you very much yeah, for taking the time. Too. Yeah, thanks. Keep working hard. It takes some time. Like I, I watch people call for young goaltenders to be put in the National Hockey League. Lean on them. Capitalize on them. Let's get them in there. Let's see what they got. It does take so long for a goaltender to be ready for that. And there's guys that do it, and inevitably, there's a blip. And you wonder, did it happen too fast? For him, you heard him talking about the the differences between playing in Sweden and playing in North America. I thought, to be honest with you, the adjustment period would take longer for him just because the game's so different. And he seems to have acclimatized to it. I mean, not perfectly, but relatively seamlessly in a fast, you know, sort of fast order here. So that bodes well as well. Your ability to sort of take in new information and adjust. They're still working some on some things. You heard him talk about pace, and I've seen it in practice with Marco Terranius. Um, I was out there a fair bit this week between watching Abbotsford and watching Bakersfield with Jack Campbell in town and um, just really stressing pace and rotation, pace and rotation, two things that he needs to, you know, uh, together too, right? Like, cause being fast, but not having the rotation in your game, you're not, you're not actually gaining angle on the puck. So, you know, what just maintaining mean, pace and rotation. Well, pace is just fast. Everything fast, fast, fast. You can't, you can't drift into stuff. You need to beat that oh. pass, you know, or, or so beat that play, sounds, get okay. to your spot. Just yeah. fast pace. But rotation is like, if you're not rotating into angle, if you're just pushing across, like you can be fast and inefficient at the same time. Like there's an F, you know, an element to, of efficiency involved. And if you gain rotation in your movements, you're going to be on angle when you arrive. So that's where the efficiency comes from. And if you don't gain rotation, chances are you're going to be arriving not in a good set position and you're going to get beat. So, uh, or leaving great big holes behind yeah, you. Exactly. Or, or yeah. allowing a goal, somebody to just pull you out wide and not being able to get back to your post. So a lot of things like that, just consistency that he needs to, and that's a big body, man, six, six, like rotation's not easy when you're as big as he is. There's a, those are long limbs. You got to get onto angle before you push. And when you're trying to go fast and pace, 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 the tendency is to go before you establish that angle. And then you're not accomplishing all the goals you want. So, um, it's a process he's committed to. You heard him talk about it and it's one that might take a little time, but there's already been some really encouraging signs. 
want to mention a buddy of ours, well, yours, met him. I know him a little bit, but uh, Michael DiPietro with a great save. He posted a shout out the other night with uh, so good with the Bruins in the American Hockey League, Providence, Providence Bruins. Bruins. We got to get what? that up on our mm-hmm. social. I, you guys just been telling me about it. I've been had my head in the sand a, a little bit. Wife telling me to stay off social is, media. Oh, it's a thing of beauty to go coast to coast from from the reverse on one post to make on a save on the other side is hard enough to go from one post in the reverse to the other side in the full splits adds a whole nother level to it. And then to arrive balanced in the splits and not just falling all over the place. He looked like he could have made another save when he was done that. It was a, what an athletic move and just a great thing for people to learn from. Cause it's not just going nine, one, one, it's going nine one one and keeping that little bit in the tank so we could make another move if he needed to. Loved Two it. things. One, he's not sitting in reverse. He actually tucks into it as the place. Like I love that it's not just a passive sit. Like he goes into it and then that puck goes across and it's like bang in and out so fast. And two, pretty sure I tore a groin just watching it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he went from his blocker to his glove and made a clean catch. And and yeah, it's safe to shout out. Preserved a shutout. We like we like yeah. us some Mikey D P H. So good for him. Hell of a save. Nice to have the shuddy. And I I think it's beautiful that uh, Hutch and I have gone through this whole podcast as the best of friends. I chirped him a little bit at the start. I tried to get under his skin. He wouldn't do it. So he's a bigger man than me. And now we're all on the same page because he and I disagreed on the goal that went against the Canucks last week when Demko got uh, clipped uh, by I think it was Holloway behind the net and the Oilers scored and. Uh, Hutch thought it was goalie interference. I, I thought it was just the play that that was uh, part of a goalie sh- could have got back to his net before that. And, and, and we talked our way through it. We disagreed, but we're but we're buddies, right? We're always buddies. Of course, we're buddies. People can disagree and be buddies. And you can chirp me in because I only bother chirping my friends, so it's all good. I actually didn't tell you that I then took that video. I put it into an editing program. I slowed it way down so I could watch it frame by frame and started to agree with you, Darren. <laughs> He's, he, got, he got caught setting a pick there. He did. Yeah. I really, really wanted to prove to you that I was right because, yeah, but, you but know I'm not sure I, that I, I was right. I bet you it's 30% of the time he I gets actually, the call. I have no issue with him. I, I have no issue yeah. with the guy setting a pick. You still can't knock him yeah. over. He's entitled to the ice, but he, he that one looked pretty. He just had time to get back to his net before that, but anyway. And that's yeah. irrelevant, too. You can still stand there if you had time get, to get back he to your net. He leaned into it ever that so one. slightly. I always will, <laughs> but that was the part that maybe was He did issue. lean into it ever so slightly in free spares, yeah, didn't he? Slightly. Uh, yeah, anything going slightly. on? If you want to set a pick, you are not required to rush back to your net, Derek. Anything going on on the, uh, the old website, in Mag? Uh, there's always great stuff going on. So much stuff that we can't back. remember and so much okay. stuff coming. Just make sure you tune in. We've actually got a crap ton of stuff coming. We just need to dig, get a little time for us to get it online, but it's coming this week. What's coming is Woody and I were hanging out in Vancouver this weekend, and we've already done the feature interview for next week's podcast. You can't miss it. Which was really cool. Yeah, our good friend James Wenland, the guy of... Five damn things, baby. Five damn things for the hips, five damn things for the feet, and there's going to be a lot more five damn things coming down the road. And you get to hear the whole backstory on James, on his profession, his expertise, his feelings on goaltenders. He likes to rattle people's cages a little bit. He has some treatment that is not hard to do, but an absolute game changer for you. It is so easy that Woody and his wife went to see James the next day just so Woody's wife could learn how to treat his crazy head. So you can learn by listening to James. I've learned from listening to James, and I just think he's one of the uh, more exciting people on the landscape for goaltenders to learn from. Can't wait. And the next day I went back and he put my head on straight. That's kind of what I was talking about. Like straight? His head's You're facing on. the right way, right? Ah. Well, he straightened my head out too, actually, which is funny. I didn't even know it wasn't straight. Like Did literally, uh, literally just... my, my vision improved. No, we didn't make me taller. Although he does have a way of making sure you can get that extra half inch when it's time he to do your central scouting measurement. Too, didn't he? That's right. Really? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah, can't yeah. Wait to hear it. Some counterintuitive things to make you a little bit taller. That should probably be our leading video right there, but I think we might want to keep that one in our. Yeah. Our in case, stuff, in case I ever pocket. need to get listed by central scouting, I need that extra half inch to get back to six foot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the secret agent. 
Cam over at the Hockey Shop, source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. We love their support and uh, their partnership with Ingle Radio, the podcast, as well as NHL Sense Arena. You can be on the ice with National Hockey League shooters. Uh, give it a shot today because uh, once you try it, it will change your game. And of course, uh, everybody listening uh, over an hour today, love it. Uh, a lot to get to, heavy hearts, and as well as uh, riding the wave of uh, the career of Henrik Lundqvist and Mike Vernon, uh, among others. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. We already know who the guest is. Can't wait to chat with you on Ingle Radio, the podcast. <laughs>